Welcome to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. Each week, we feature an episode from the best independent creators. Hit subscribe for more great true crime content. If you would like to help Indie Drop-In support indie creators, you can buy us a coffee. Just go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Indie Drop-In or click the link in the show notes below. Today's episode is from The Crime Tree. Don't forget to check out the show notes for links to subscribe and follow on social media. Enjoy the show. Begin. The Crime Tree is a true crime podcast detailing the crimes and events committed against others. Listener discretion is advised. In early February of 2012, Colleen Margaret Povey was in the final days of her breast cancer battle. As her family surrounded her hospital bedside, her eyes remained fixed on the door, desperately searching for the faces of her daughter and granddaughter, whom she hadn't seen in nearly three and a half years. Back in October of 2008, Colleen's daughter, 20-year-old Carly, had loaded up her 1996 Holden Commodore station wagon buckled her two-year-old daughter Candelise into her car seat, farewelled her family and friends before embarking on a new adventure. She had plans to travel. She left her Northern Territory Alice Springs home and began her 15-hour long journey to Adelaide, South Australia. Over the coming months, contact with Carly became less frequent and eventually altogether stopped. And in November of the following year, Colleen reported her and Candelise as missing. Initial investigations into the missing persons report found that Carly's phone was still active and her bank accounts were still being used. Police were eventually able to make phone contact and the woman who answered their calls informed them that she was in fact Carly and that she had chosen to distance herself from her family for personal reasons. Happy with this, investigators closed the missing persons reports and Colleen had no choice but to settle with the sporadic text messages that came from Carly. With her diagnosis of terminal breast cancer, Colleen and other family members tried desperately to reach out to Carly, begging her to come home before it was too late. But Carly and Candelise never came home. As Colleen's body became weaker, she squeezed her husband Scott's hand and asked, Is Carly and Candelise here yet? These were Colleen Povey's final words and with hours she passed away at the age of just 44. You are listening to The Crime Tree. I'm your host, Jasmine, and this is the heartbreaking story of 20-year-old Carly Pierce Stevenson and her two-year-old daughter, Candelise. Carly Jade Pierce Stevenson was born on the 7th of August, 1988, in Alice Springs, located in Australia's Northern Territory. She attended Breitling Primary School before moving on to Alice Springs High School at the age of 13. Carly loved playing netball and was a member of the netball teams throughout both primary and secondary school. She was small and quick which earned her the nickname of Mouse amongst her teammates and friends. On weekends and holidays Carly would spend her days fishing and camping and on several occasions accompanied her stepfather Scott as he hit the wide open roads driving trucks across the vast Australian outback. At the age of 16, Carly left school and began working at her auntie's tuck shop in town, and just shy of her 18th birthday, on the 19th of June 2006, she gave birth to a little girl she named Candelise Kiara Pierce, who was quickly given the adorable nickname of Candles. Despite her young age, Carly jumped headfirst into her role as a single mother. Candelise was her top and main priority, and other than the occasional night out with friends, the mother and daughter were always together. It was on one of these nights out that Carly met a local man named Robbie. Robbie was working as a doorman at the Alice Springs pub that Carly and her friends were attending that night. After striking up a conversation, the two quickly became a couple, and not long after, Carly and little Candelise moved in with him. Robbie adored Carly and doted on her daughter, treating her as his own. All was going well in Carly's life until Robbie introduced her to a couple who were new in town. Through work, Robbie had met 33-year-old Daniel Holdham. 
The two struck up a friendship and before long, Robbie and Carly spent much of their free time in the company of Daniel, his girlfriend Hazel Passmore, and Hazel's three young children, the youngest of which was the same age as Candelise. It didn't take long for Robbie and Carly to learn that Daniel Holdham was an interstate drug runner, bringing large quantities of illicit substances into the region from his regular trips to and from Adelaide, 1,500 kilometres south of Alice Springs in South Australia, where Daniel and Hazel had lived prior to moving to Alice Springs. And while Carly had occasionally smoked marijuana, she began trying heavier drugs at the insistence of both Daniel and Hazel. Within six months of meeting the pair, Carly found herself on a downward spiral, and just after her 20th birthday in August 2008, Carly moved herself and Candelise out of Robbie's home and into the home of her grandmother Connie, in an attempt to put some distance between them. But just weeks later, Carly received a phone call that would not only change her life, but would ultimately end it. On the evening of September the 15th, 2008, Daniel had left Alice Springs for another of his runs to Adelaide, but this time he had Hazel Passmore and her three young children with him. Less than an hour after crossing the Northern Territory South Australian border, Daniel Holdham lost control of his vehicle just near the small Aboriginal community of Indulkana. The four-wheel drive they were in rolled five or six times coming to rest on its roof amongst the shrubs and red dirt that surrounded the Stewart Highway. A truck driver came across the scene not long after to find Hazel's two oldest children dead, having been thrown from the vehicle. Hazel was trapped upside down in the car, slipping in and out of consciousness, her youngest child injured but still alive strapped in her baby seat. Surprisingly, Daniel walked away from this accident relatively unharmed. Hazel and her baby daughter were rushed to Alice Springs Hospital before being airlifted to the larger Adelaide Hospital, which was more equipped to deal with the type of injuries that Hazel had sustained. Hazel's leg had to be amputated and she was placed in an induced coma to allow her body to recover. Upon receiving the phone call to inform her of the accident, Carly's first thought was that she needed to be there to support her friends, so she bundled Candelise into the car and drove through the night and well into the next day until she reached the Adelaide Hospital. Daniel had booked himself into a motel close by and allowed for both Carly and Candelise to share his accommodation. The two took in turns sitting by the bedside of both Hazel and her young daughter. Just over two weeks later, Hazel was woken from her coma to learn that she had not only lost her two children, she'd also lost her leg and would spend the rest of her life in a wheelchair. And although grateful for Carly being there to offer her support, Hazel began to notice that there was something going on between Daniel and Carly. But Daniel reassured her that there was nothing to worry about and set about trying to find a suitable house for her to live in once she was released from hospital. It was at this point that Carly returned to Alice Springs with Candelise, but their stay was to be just a brief one. Carly had decided to make the temporary move to Adelaide to stay with Hazel and Daniel for a while before setting out to travel around Australia once Hazel had recovered enough to not need her help. So in October of 2008, Carly said goodbye to her family and they watched and waved as her car disappeared from view, not knowing that they would never see Carly or Candelise again. Carly and Candelise arrived back in Adelaide just as Hazel was getting ready to be discharged from hospital. The funeral for Hazel's two children still needed to be organised, so Carly stepped in to help where she could. The funeral was held on the 13th of November 2008, and the following morning, Hazel woke to find Carly's car, along with Daniel, Carly and two-and-a-half-year-old Candelise, gone. Under her pillow was a wad of cash and a note informing her of their departure. Two days later, Daniel, Carly and Candelise turned up 1,200 kilometres east at the home of Daniel's cousin, Christine Lancaster, and her partner, Derek Dover, in the Canberra suburb of Charnwood in the ACT. Christine and Derek opened their home to the trio, inviting them to stay for as long as they needed, while Daniel looked for work opportunities in the area. As Carly spent more and more time with Daniel, I'm sure she began to realise the mistake she had made. Daniel had become agitated after receiving a text from Hazel informing him that she was going to sue him over the accident and for the injuries that she sustained. The two began arguing and Carly was overheard telling Daniel that she just wanted to go home. 
After one intense argument in the early morning hours of December the 14th, 2008, Daniel and Carly left Candelise in the care of Daniel's cousin, and the two went for a drive to sort out their differences. Twelve hours later, Daniel returned to his cousin's house in Charnwood with Carly's car, but Carly was nowhere to be found. When questioned, Daniel told his cousin Christine that Carly had insisted he drop her off at a bus stop where she was going to make her own way back home, and that he had promised that he would drive Candelise back to her grandmother's house in Alice Springs. To ease Christine's concerns, Daniel lied and told her that Carly had often left Candelise and taken off and this was no different. Two days later, Daniel somehow managed to trade Carly's car in for a 1991 white Holden Statesman, before packing up their belongings at his cousin's house to begin the long drive back west with little Candelise. Less than a week later, he was on Hazel's doorstep begging her for forgiveness and informing her that Carly and Candelise had moved on to Queensland. Hazel relented and the two were a couple once again. Hazel didn't want to lose him again and told herself that she would do whatever she had to in an effort to make him stay. Almost a year later, when Colleen filed the missing persons report, she informed them that the last time she'd properly spoke with her daughter was in early December the year before and that she'd been in the company of Daniel Holdham. Police were quick to locate Daniel at the house he shared with Hazel in Adelaide and he informed them that he hadn't seen or heard from Carly since she left with Candelise before Christmas of 2008, claiming that she had plans to drive to Queensland. Several days later, Colin received a text from Carly's phone letting her know that they were safe and well. A check of Carly's bank accounts showed that her card was being used regularly, with numerous ATM withdrawals throughout Queensland, consistent with Daniel's explanation. The police, however, were not satisfied until they had either cited or spoke with the young mother and after repeated calls to her cell phone, they eventually got through. The woman on the other end of the line informed them that she was Carly, and that she did not want her family to know where she was. It is not a crime for an adult to voluntarily go missing, so the police were satisfied with this, and only 10 days after being reported as missing, the files against Carly and Candelise were closed. Right up until she passed away, Colleen received the occasional text message from Carly's phone. The brief correspondence was usually to ask for money to be deposited into her account so that she and Candelise could fly home. Every single time, Colleen put the money in Carly's account, and every single time she waited desperately for Carly and Candelise to come home. In the final months of her life, Colleen had deposited more than $7,000 into the account, but Carly and Candelise never came back. Then, on the 14th of July 2015, the skeletal remains of a small child were found stuffed into a suitcase along the Karoonda Highway, just outside the tiny town of Wanaka in South Australia's Murray Mallee region, approximately 120 kilometres southeast of Adelaide. Scattered around the suitcase were numerous items of girls' clothing, including a pink and white striped dress, a tutu from Cotton on Kids, and a Dora the Explorer t-shirt, along with a distinctive handmade patchwork quilt. It appeared that the suitcase had been there for a long time, showing severe weather damage which enabled the local wildlife to scatter much of its contents, but the remains of this small child had barely been touched. Tests quickly revealed that the remains had been there for between 5 to 10 years, and were that of a little girl aged between 2 and and 4 years old with the medical examiner concluding that she had met a violent end. Little damage to her bones revealed that her cause of death was most likely suffocation. Several Chuck's brand blue and white dishcloths had been stuffed into her mouth and throat, and a disposable diaper had then been placed over her face, and all this was held in place with silver-coloured duct tape, which had been wrapped tightly around her head. The little girl had then been wrapped in a white blood-stained towel, before being concealed in the large suitcase and discarded along the rural stretch of highway in the middle of nowhere. Due to the decomposition of all of her soft tissue and internal organs, the coroner was unable to tell if she had died due to her head being wrapped up or whether she had died prior to this happening. DNA tests failed to yield this little girl's identity 
and there were no missing persons reports that matched her description anywhere in Australia. The little girl became Australia's child and was dubbed the Wanaka Angel. Over the next few months, South Australian detectives worked tirelessly to identify the Wanaka Angel, her DNA even being tested against that of missing British toddler Madeleine McCann. Newspapers and television stations all across the country made continuous appeals to the public, releasing images of the girl's clothing and the distinctive handmade quilt in the hopes that someone would recognise them. Task Force Mallee was formed to follow up on every single lead that came in. Then, almost three months after being found, call number 1267 to Crime Stoppers nominated Candelise Pierce as being the Wanaka Angel. The caller was a woman named Tanya Webber, and she told investigators that the quilt looked eerily similar to the one her good friend Colleen Povey had made for the birth of her granddaughter over nine years earlier. She had even provided police with a photo of little Candelise in her stroller snuggled up with her quilt. Tanya explained that no one had seen Carly or Candelise in years and that the last she heard they were living in Queensland. Detectives from Task Force Mallee quickly jumped on this promising lead and were quick to learn that Candelise's immunisations were not up to date, her last one being in June 2008 at the age of two and there were no records of Candelise ever being enrolled in school. Obtaining Candelise's birth records from the Alice Springs Hospital where she was born, her known DNA from her newborn heel prick screening test was compared to the DNA found on the towel that the Wanaka Angel was wrapped up in. And within weeks of Tanya Weber contacting Crime Stoppers, the remains in the suitcase were formally identified as being that of two-year-old Candelise Kiara Pierce. But for investigators, this conclusion provided more questions than it did answers, and the desperate search for Carly Pierce Stevenson began. Concerned that Carly had met the same fate as her daughter, a nationwide search of unidentified remains began. They were looking for a young Caucasian woman, approximately 100 centimetres or 5 feet 2 inches tall, and around the age of 20. Entering this into the database, the computer quickly came back with one possible match. This match was to the skeletal remains found five years earlier in New South Wales' notorious Blanglow State Forest, some 1,100 kilometres northeast of where Candelise's remains were found. On August 29, 2010, a group of men had travelled from Sydney to spend the day riding their dirt bikes along some of the many fire trails that run through the Belangolo State Forest. Having missed a corner, one of the riders veered off the track and found himself in a small clearing. As he was turning his bike around, he spotted what looked to him to be a human femur bone. Several of the other riders had stopped after seeing him ride off the track and he showed them the bone, all agreeing that it belonged most likely to a kangaroo but after several hours of being unable to shake the weird feeling that the bone was human, the rider convinced his mates to go with him back to the area where he went off the track. It was then that they found more bones, along with a human skull. The men immediately called the nearby Balral Police Station and told them of their horrific find. The officer who took their call, however, was not concerned. He explained to them that they received calls from the public so often about apparent human bones found in the forest that it had become a requirement for the caller to send a photo of the bones to the sergeant on duty before anyone would be dispatched. For some, this might sound like an odd request, but given the Blanglo State Forest's dark background, I can understand why this had become a requirement. The Belanglo State Forest was thrown into the national and international spotlight in the early 1990s as the dumping ground of one of Australia's worst serial killers, Ivan Milat. Between 1989 and 1993, Ivan Milat kidnapped and killed five international backpackers and two Australian backpackers, with all seven bodies being found in the Belanglo State Forest. Despite an extensive search being done throughout the entire forest after Milat's arrest, Visitors to the forest continue to this day to report the find of what they think are human remains. But after one glance of the photo sent through by the dirt bike riders, 
a team of forensic investigators were immediately dispatched to the area. The remains were found to be that of a young Caucasian female, anywhere from 13 to 25 years of age. Examination of the bones found that several of her ribs had been fractured and her neck had been broken. Near the remains was a clump of light strawberry blonde hair, an earring, one sock and a girl's chain reaction brand size 10 t-shirt that had the word angelic printed across the front. Although many speculated that this might be another of Ivan Milat's victims, this was quickly ruled out after it was determined that the bones had only been there for no more than five years. Despite months of national media appeals, ongoing checks of the DNA and missing persons database, and a composite reconstruction of what the victim may have looked like done by facial anthropologist Susan Hayes, no one came forward with any information that could help in identifying her. For the next five years, her remains sat in a box at the Glebe Morgue in Sydney, New South Wales, and she became known as the Angel of Belangelo. But after getting this hit during the search for Carly, her known DNA from her medical records was sent to New South Wales to test against that of the unidentified remains found five years earlier. And in late October of 2015, seven years after setting out on a new adventure, it was announced to the public that the Angel of Belangelo and the Wanaka Angel were in fact mother and daughter, the remains belonging to that of 20-year-old Carly Jade Pierce Stevenson and two-year-old Candelise Kiara Pierce. This announcement was a devastating blow for the family and friends of Carly and Candelise. For seven years, they had remained alive in the minds of their loved ones through infrequent communication, believing that both were out there somewhere living their best lives, praying that one day they would return alive and well. After making the identifications, police were quickly able to locate the last person that they were known to be with, Daniel Holdham, who was already incarcerated on child sex offence charges. Daniel refused to talk, but because he was already locked up, this gave detectives plenty of time to do an extensive and thorough investigation into his movements from around the time Carly and Candelise were last seen up until his recent arrest. And what they found painted the horrific picture of Carly and Candelise's last days alive, Daniel's sick and depraved motives for their murders, and the extent that he went to to fraudulently gain access to tens of thousands of dollars deposited into Carly's bank account. Using phone records, bank and credit card transactions, cell phone tower data and evidence collected from numerous raids on properties known to be linked to Daniel Holdham and Hazel Passmore, including journal entries and images found on a digital camera's SD memory card that belonged to Daniel, the detectives were able to piece together the following. Back in the early morning hours of December the 14th, 2008, when Daniel and Carly had left Candelise in the care of Daniel's cousin, to go for a drive to sort out their differences, cell phone tower data revealed that the two travelled 170 kilometres northeast, arriving in the vicinity of Sutton Forest, which is a small town about 10 kilometres from the Belangelo State Forest. This cell phone tower at Sutton Forest is the closest to the Belangelo State Forest, so visitors to this area will ping from this tower. They arrived in the area just before 5 a.m and the last cell phone tower ping from both phones in the area was hours later at 12.16pm. Time-stamped images from Daniel's SD card filled in those seven hours spent in the area. A series of photos taken by Daniel showed Carly's half-naked body lying on the ground as Daniel violently sexually assaulted her with foreign objects. In the next set of photos, Daniel's foot can be seen standing upon her throat. It is unclear whether Carly was alive or deceased when these photos were taken. The t-shirt she was wearing in these pictures was the one that was found next to her remains. The next ping from both Daniel and Carly's phones were at around 2pm that afternoon when Daniel arrived back at his cousin's house in Charnwood without Carly, explaining that he had dropped her off at the bus station. Daniel remained in the area with Candelise for the next few days leaving the ACT in the early morning hours of December the 19th. He began driving west through New South Wales and down towards South Australia. 
credit card activity revealed that Daniel stopped at a Woolworth supermarket in Wagga Wagga just before 9am where he purchased rubbish bags, silver coloured duct tape, body wash and wet wipes. He then drove a further 100 kilometres before checking in to the Narendera Midtown Motor Inn with one child. The payment for this room was registered through FPOS at exactly 11.05am. The Motor Inn still had the registration card that Daniel had filled in and signed, and he even left a fingerprint on it. Cell phone tower technology showed that Daniel stayed in the vicinity of the motel for just over two hours, until around 1.20pm. It is unclear as to what took place in the motel room, but the towel that was found wrapped around little Candelisa's remains was linked back to the same batch number as the ones supplied at the motel. From here, Daniel travelled west along the Sturt Highway, passing through Wanaka, where Candelisa's remains were found seven years later. Arriving back at the home of Hazel Passmore in Adelaide, Daniel eventually confided in her as to what he had done. But instead of going to the authorities, Hazel assumed Carly's identity to gain access to her welfare and child support payments. On two occasions, one in 2010 and the other in 2011, she even attended appointments at the bank and at the Centrelink office with both Carly and Candelisa's birth certificates to prove her identity in an effort to stop Carly's payments from being cancelled. Hazel maintained enough contact with Carly's family via her mobile phone to stop them from going to the police and reporting her missing again. And it was Hazel who spoke to the police pretending to be Carly when her mother had reported her missing in 2009. Journal entries written in Hazel's handwriting under the direction of Daniel revealed just how sick this monster was. The names of hundreds of children were listed, including Candelisa's and beside each one was one of three words, consent, rape, or forced. Another journal contained all of Daniel's sick fantasies involving children, again written by Hazel. It soon became clear that Daniel had murdered Carly to gain access to little Candelise, and one can only assume that her final moments must have been horrendous. By December 2015, Daniel was charged with the murders of both Carly and Candelise, and in July 2018, the then 44-year-old was given two life sentences without the possibility of parole, ensuring that Daniel James Holdham will die behind bars. Hazel Passmore was never charged over her involvement. 20-year-old Carly Jade Pierce Stevenson and 2-year-old Candelise Kiara Pierce were laid to rest in a shared white coffin on Friday, December 11, 2015 at the Alice Springs Garden Cemetery in a family plot alongside Carly's mother Colleen Povey and her grandmother Connie. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next week when we bring you another story picked fresh straight from the crime tree. All photos pertaining to this case will be up on our Instagram at the crime tree. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop In. If you would like your show featured, reach out to us at Indie Drop In on all social media or go to indiedropin.com. See you next time.